Welcome to part two of the series, The Abrahamic Promises as a Foundation for the Gospel of the Kingdom. In part one, we established that God had made three distinct promises to Abraham, the promise of land, the promise of descendants, and the promise of blessing to all nations. In part one, we showed from scripture that the land God promised to Abraham was actual physical land in what used to be called Canaan. Furthermore, the possession and ownership of that physical land was promised to be everlasting. In part two, we'll explore the second promise, the promise of descendants. When God initially called Abraham, there is no indication in the scriptures that God's selection of him was based on his genetics. Instead, it was because of Abraham's faith, willingness to obey, and his unwavering belief in the singular God, Yahweh, even in a world filled with various polytheistic religions. The primary focus was not on Abraham as the progenitor of a particular race of people, but rather as the patriarch of a community devoted to Yahweh as their sole and true God. This is why, in Exodus 3.6, Yahweh conveyed to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. These three names mark the inception of what would become the Hebrew people and nation. Isaac was the son of Abraham, Jacob was Isaac's son, and Jacob's twelve sons served as the cornerstone for the formation of the twelve tribes of Israel. Moreover, the same covenant that God initially made with Abraham was extended to Isaac and Jacob, as evidenced in Exodus 33.1. Yahweh instructed Moses, Depart and proceed from this place, taking with you the people you led out of the land of Egypt to the land I promised to give to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's important to note that when Moses received this instruction, more than four centuries had passed since the time of Abraham. God had not in any way overlooked his promise. Moses was entrusted with the task of guiding a vast population of individuals who had never experienced freedom through the arid wilderness to reach Canaan. However, it would take another four decades before the Hebrew people would finally set foot in the promised land. Jacob, who later received the name Israel, gathered his twelve sons in the 49th chapter of Genesis. This event occurred after his family had relocated to Egypt, facilitated by one of his sons, Joseph, who had been sold into slavery by his envious brothers many years prior. Through divine guidance and providence, Joseph had risen to a position of great authority in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. In Genesis 49, Jacob imparts his words to his sons offering insights into what shall happen to you in the days to come. Jacob's words are captivating as he not only prophesies about each son individually, but also delineates the future characteristics of these tribes. Towards the end of the chapter in verse 28, it says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, giving a blessing to each one of them suited for them. Jacob, who had been renamed Israel, then died. Throughout the history of Israel as a nation, we observe the inclusion of foreigners and strangers who played crucial roles. For instance, individuals like Ruth, who was a Moabite, found herself as an ancestor of Jesus himself. It's important to emphasize that the concept of race, as we understand it today, was not a central consideration in the biblical narrative. Ruth's narrative primarily revolves around her faith, character, and her pivotal position in the lineage of King David and ultimately Jesus Christ as documented in the New Testament's genealogy. Similarly, there were other individuals like Rahab, whose story can be found in the second chapter of Joshua that exemplify this pattern. Despite being foreigners to the Israelite tribes, their faith allowed them to become members of the nation of Israel. Interestingly, it was Rahab's son, Boaz, who married Ruth, the Moabite. Thus, we witness that race, ethnicity, and genetics held no significance in determining who could be considered children of Abraham in the Old Testament. It was the Apostle Paul, who was born a Jew himself, who makes this startling statement in Romans 9, 1-8, which emphasizes this very point. I speak the truth in Christ and do not lie, my conscience bearing witness in the Holy Spirit, that I feel extreme sorrow and unending anguish in my heart. For my wish is that I myself should be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, 
my kinsmen by way of the flesh. They are Israelites, and as such to them belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. The patriarchs belong to them, and from their race, according to the flesh, came the Christ who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. But it isn't that the word of God has failed. For not all who are descendants of Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham just because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children by way of the flesh who are called children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. That being said, it's important to note that a specific aspect of family lineage held significant importance regarding the promise of descendants and the ownership of the land in God's covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 13, 14 through 16, we can clearly discern that it was Abraham's descendants or offspring who would be the recipients of the land. Yahweh said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Look around you, gaze to the north, south, east, and west, for all the land you see will be given to you and your descendants. I will multiply your descendants like the dust of the earth, so that they cannot be counted, even if one could count the dust of the earth. In the New Testament, John the Baptist approaches the concept of being genetically linked to Abraham with a slightly different perspective, as seen in Luke 3.8. While he preached about repentance and baptism, John sternly addressed the Jews present, saying, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. As we delve more into the New Testament and explore its teachings on the promises made to Abraham, it becomes evident that, although John's statement may seem somewhat exaggerated, he was not entirely off base in what he conveyed. Now that we've established what the first two promises specifically meant, we must now answer a few questions. First, did Abraham ever truly own or possess the land he was promised? Secondly, have any of his descendants ever possessed the land of promise in an uninterrupted or everlasting way? The simple answer to both questions is no. In Acts 7, 1 through 5, we see the answer to the first question. The high priest said, are these things true? And Stephen said, Brother and fathers, hear me. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Leave your land and your kindred and go into the land I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after the death of his father, God moved him on from there into this land in which you now live. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. While Abraham resided in the promised land, the prospect of him genuinely possessing or owning the entire expanse of that land was entirely unattainable. Even with the birth of his son Isaac, followed by his grandson Jacob and Jacob's twelve sons, it remained implausible for this family to lay claim to such an extensive territory. Instead, they were essentially temporary residents in it. In essence, Abraham and his family merely sojourned and resided in the land without ever establishing true ownership over any part of it. By the time Jacob had come to the end of his life, the entire family had even left the promised land altogether and lived for the next four centuries in Egypt. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes this point in Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should thereafter receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He left, not knowing where he would be going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, and whose designer and builder is God. Given that Abraham clearly never held actual possession or ownership of the land he was promised, should we conclude that God misled him or reneged on his promise? If not, how could this promise possibly be fulfilled now, considering Abraham has been deceased for millennia? In a conversation with a group of Sadducees who did not subscribe to the belief in the resurrection of the dead, Jesus employed some semantic reasoning to underscore that resurrection was indeed part of God's divine plan. He cited the Old Testament in Mark 12:26 through 27, saying, 
Regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Did you grasp the essence of the point Jesus was making? Even during Moses' time, centuries after the deaths of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God used the present tense when speaking to Moses. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The message is crystal clear. God is not the God of the deceased. He is the God of the living. For this statement to hold true, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would necessitate a resurrection to life. In fact, for Abraham to realize the promise of possessing the land, he will be resurrected in the future. So it's clear that neither Abraham nor even his son or grandsons ever held possession or ownership of the promised land. It's important to keep in mind the specific language of the covenant as stated in Genesis 13, 15, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. And in Genesis 17, 8, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. While it's true that Abraham's descendants, the nation of Israel, did have control over this land for extended periods, historical records make it clear that they never possessed it forever or in an everlasting manner. We cannot therefore truly say the promise of land was or has been fulfilled. Throughout the history of Israel as a nation, it was conquered numerous times. The following provides a brief summary of Israel's history as a conquered nation. The Babylonian exile, 586 through 538 BC, the Babylonian Empire, under King Nebuchadnezzar, captured Jerusalem, destroyed the first temple, and deported many Israelites to Babylon. This event marked the Babylonian exile, during which the Israelites were removed from their land and remained in exile until the Persian king Cyrus the Great allowed them to return and rebuild the temple. The Assyrian Exile of the Northern Kingdom, 722 through 721 BC. The Northern Kingdom of Israel, also known as the Kingdom of Samaria, fell to the Assyrian Empire under King Shalmaneser V and King Sargon II. The ten northern tribes were deported and scattered, leading to the lost tribes of Israel. The Roman Destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD The Roman Empire, led by Titus, destroyed the Second Temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD during the First Jewish-Roman War. This event resulted in the dispersion of Jewish people and the loss of control over Jerusalem and the land. Finally, various invasions and foreign rule. Throughout their history, Israel faced invasions and foreign rule by different empires, including the Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires, which often disrupted their sovereignty and control over the land. Thank you for tuning in to the second installment of the Abrahamic promises as the basis for the gospel of the kingdom. In our upcoming third part, we will delve into the promise of blessing for all nations. Hopefully, we have gained a deeper understanding of the first two promises and recognize that the ultimate fulfillment of the everlasting land possession promise remains pending. We should also have a better idea of what it truly means to be counted among Abraham's descendants or offspring. And with just a verse or two from the New Testament, we should be starting to grasp that being a descendant of Abraham goes beyond mere genetics. As we explore the third promise, which involves blessings for all nations, it will become increasingly evident how these three original promises to Abraham serve as the sturdy foundation for the gospel of the kingdom.